at the heart of Mistra was the court. And at the heart of the court, this little pretty church, named after the great old court church of Constantinople, St. Sophia. There's not much left here now. Just Christ up there on the wall and a few beautiful fragments of marble. Most of the church has been stripped out completely. There's even a little double-headed eagle still up there, the double-headed eagle of the last emperors of Byzantium. But the real treasure is here on the floor. Look at this. See that? That stone there, that purple stone, that's imperial porphyry. That's a stone, well, it's the half magical stone of Byzantium. When this church was built, it hadn't even been mined for a thousand years. Yet little chippings of it were taken around the world and set in floors like this. It was the stone in which Roman emperors had been born in rooms that were covered in it. This, though, is probably the very stone where the last emperor of Byzantium was crowned. Constantine Paleologus, the last ruler of Mystra, was crowned here on the 6th of January, 1449. Three years later, he died fighting on the walls of Constantinople as the Turks took the city. In the 13th century, a family of nomad Turkish shepherds called the Ottomans packed their tents and rode out of Central Asia. Two centuries later, the Islamic armies of the Ottoman Turks, commanded by members of that same family, had conquered most of the territory of Byzantium and a large part of Southeast Europe too. The center of this enlarging Turkish empire was a city at the borders of modern Greece and Turkey, the city of Edirne, the capital of the Turkish sultans. In those days, Edirne was a hectic international city, the city of great mosques, hospitals, concert halls, munitions works, and grand bazaars. This is one of the colleges of learning at Edirne. In Sultan Mehmet's time, there were many of them here, and they formed a circle like a university around the court. It was an international university. There were Italians here teaching the Sultan's children how to speak Greek. Byzantine nobles sometimes sent their children here for a good education. Old Plethon came here as a young man. Here it was, he met Persian fire worshippers who taught him all about their strange religion. Here it was, too. He first read the works of the ancient Greek Aristotle. Clearly, this dynamic, international, rich, powerful society was far more than a match for the poor old empire of Byzantium. It was also clear that the ancient city of Constantinople had been engulfed by this adolescent multinational empire, that Constantinople lay at the strategic center of its trade routes, and on the supply lines of the Turkish armies that were eating into Eastern Europe. That is why Byzantium was doomed. In 1438, the Emperor John VIII sailed out of Constantinople in a last attempt to beg aid from the reluctant West in his struggle with the Turks. After 77 days at sea, the Imperial Convoy arrived at the friendly port of Venice. The West had always said that military aid for Constantinople was dependent upon Byzantium's reunion with the Church of Rome. 
the churches of the East and West, Greek and Latin, had split apart six centuries before. So the Emperor John had sailed with his theologians and his bishops, not his generals or his admirals. In all, some 700 people on the sea, the scholars of Byzantium. Plethon, too, had come especially from Nistra in Greece, as had many of his pupils. The most extraordinary thing about this gathering, that there were bishops and priests from all the cities of the ancient East, all the cities founded by Greece and Rome, the cities of Alexander the Great, the cities of the seven wonders of the world, all had their representatives at the council, all at once and all together. It was as if the old world had come to meet the new. But there was plague abroad in northern Italy. Two Byzantine bishops perished in the first weeks of negotiations. The emperor and his retinue rode away from danger, over the mountains and down to the central plain of Italy. Here, perhaps, at Florence, they might forge that union with the West that Byzantium so desperately needed. And here, too, they were memorialized in the frescoes of Bonozzo Gozzoli, painted in the townhouse of the Medici family, the bankers who were sponsoring this Council of the Churches. That's John VIII, John Paleologus from Mistra, Emperor of Byzantium, come to the West to seek aid. He'd ruled 12 years at this point. And when he got here, the Florentines, those dedicated followers of fashion, thought he was a knockout. They had never seen turbans like that or crowns like that. The jewelers liked it. The, the Florentine weavers liked it, the painters liked it. This was a man whose dress and demeanor influenced fashion here almost for a century. They didn't like him much, though. They thought all the Greeks were haughty, sarcastic people who seemed to be laughing at jokes that they wouldn't share with the Florentine. Didn't like them at all, really. What they were experiencing, actually, was a typical Greek thing. It was the full force of the divine right of kings. See, in the West that had rather diminished, the West that had pinched the idea of the emperor had now taken to electing Western emperors. They were confirmed by popes. There was common law, power in the West that seeped down and down and down away from the man who now was like only at the top of a vast pyramid of power. In Byzantium, everything resided in the one man. Now, in the West, and here it is, out for a stroll in the country. Cosimo and the other 700 Medici, all on their horses. This is entirely reversed. I mean, here you've got a man who is a banker, a politician, a multinational businessman, you might say. The West was entirely different. The central disagreement, then, was about these different attitudes to power in East and West about power and precedence amongst the lords of earth and heaven. Most of the Byzantines, though, were insulted at the very idea of arguing about God, whose majesty and dignity was beyond all human understanding. They thought that the clever Roman clerics they faced each day were simply impertinent and immature. After a year of recrimination and debate, the Emperor John, still desperate for military aid, simply ordered his delegation to agree to most of the West's arguments. On the 6th of June, 1439, a great act of union was signed in Florence Cathedral, right under the huge, beautiful, brand new dome. An act of union between two churches, between the Pope of Rome and his assembled clergy, the Emperor of Byzantium, and whichever of his Greeks decided to turn up that day.
The real buzz in Florence, though, wasn't in the great cathedral. It was in the streets. The Byzantines were here. These weren't the old school teachers that rich Florentines paid to teach their kids. These were the geniuses, the brightest minds of Byzantium. And here they were, carrying all the wisdom of the ancient world, it seemed. Now, the brightest of all these Greeks was Plethon. He taught practically all the people in the Greek delegation. He came straight from mystery. He was very old. He was 80. And he was as charismatic as ever. He gave lectures here, and the effect was amazing. Back at Constantinople, though, the union with Rome caused riots. Italian priests were insulted in the city's churches, and Western Europe sent no aid. Disillusioned, disappointed, the Emperor John died a few years later and was buried here in the monastery of Christ Pantocrator, Christ, Lord of Earth and Heaven. And at this same monastery, Gennadius, the theologian, preached that the union with Rome would bring down the wrath of God upon Byzantium. 